Hi folks, welcome to Keeping It Real. I'm your co-host, Fred Silverth, and... Oh. Hey, wake up, man. Oh, hey guys. I'm sorry, did I fall asleep? Yeah, you did. Oh. Anyway, uh, welcome to the show. Sorry I wasn't awake. Uh, Freddy, you pulled wake me up. I mean, I woke you up. The show already started, man. Come on. Before the show starts. That was the whole point. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyway, today we have a special guest on our show, and he's not asleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh. Well, would you like to introduce our guest? Why don't you do that since you were asleep? I didn't get the memo. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, today we have Phil Hall here. Phil, welcome to the show. Thank, thank you, you for, for uh, thank you for having me. Definitely, this is uh, quite an eye-opening experience. Yes, no, I have to apologize. You know, between Fred and uh, Rebecca, they didn't wake me up. So. Because they didn't wake me up, I was asleep at the beginning of that show. But anyway, uh, what's like I said, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. So, um, you do a whole bunch of different things. You want to tell our audience some of the stuff that you do? Some of the stuff I do. Well, I'm a writer. Uh, I have writing? a new book out, actually. I'm here to promote it. It's called In Search of Lost Films, published by Bear Manor Media. You can get this on Amazon and all the other e-commerce book sites. This book is uh, about uh, lost films, movies that have disappeared over the years, films made from the 1890s through the 1970s. We'll talk a little bit about this more later. I'm also a journalist. You can read my work at uh, National Mortgage Professional, at Profit Confidential, uh, Business Superstar. I also write about entertainment for uh, Edge Boss. Austin and Cinema Crazed and the soon-to-be-relaunched Film Threat. Also a broadcaster, I used to be a producer and co-host at PPRN Radio here in Connecticut. And starting October 3rd, I have a podcast coming back online, the online movie show with Phil Hall. It's me. And that's going to be on SoundCloud. It's going to be uh, all about uh, movies, people who make them, people who appear in them, and people who love them. And I've also acted in films. I've done about 20 movies. Uh, you may know some of my uh, more famous works, the Bikini Bloodbath trilogy. I don't know if you've seen that, or My Mouth Lies Screaming, or Abduction, or I'm drawing, no. drawing blanks here, which no. is probably just as well, because uh, these tend to be uh, no-budget horror films, comedy films. I usually play the creepy villain who gets badly killed in these <laughs> films. Some of my more famous death scenes in Bikini Bloodbath Christmas, I was disemboweled with a claw hammer. In uh, Bikini Bloodbath Car Wash, uh, my skull was split open with a machete by a maniac chef. Uh, in Mark of the Beast, I was uh, shot in the head by a beautiful woman, which was quite nice. Um, in Abduction, I was vivisected by a mad surgeon. They actually had me on a surgical table and they took a liver from the local stop and shop and covered it in jelly and plopped it on my stomach and they made believe that they were chopping me up. So that's uh, some of my cinematic work and you may, don't laugh because I've actually won the uh, B-Movie Film Festival Best Supporting Actor Award 2008 for Bikini Bloodbath Car Wash. I played, Very nice. I played uh, Professor Shipwreck in that one. That was uh, one of my best performances. Nice. So my question is, so are you more into horror films, or you are you? What kind of film? What kind of? As an actor? Yeah. As an actor, I get cast whatever they put me in. Uh, this past summer, I was in a little fantasy film called *The Fortune Teller's Fable*, in which I had two parts. I played the uh, very creepy date who was uh, pinching a beautiful girl. That was a lot of fun too. We kept doing those <laughs> scenes over and over because thankfully the there was something wrong with the sound and the camera and the lights. So. Uh, <laughs> I had like six or seven takes were going kitschy kitschy and she was like going off me. And you were uh, like staring at her. I was, I was not just staring at her, I was feeling the merchandise and I had a second role where I played a giant crow chasing this uh, lovely girl through the woods. Now we filmed this in the summer when it was about 95 degrees uh, and 100% uh, humidity and I was in a black trench coat with black gloves and I had this huge crow mask wow. on me. And it was miserable, but uh, when the camera, they said action, I had so much fun doing it. And uh, the film, which was uh, made by the uh, Dada and Human Tripod Group, actually won an award at the uh, 48 Hour Film Project uh, down the road in New Haven. Now, d you didn't get killed that one, did you? Uh, no, I didn't. I'm surprised. I d well, actually, in the, it's implied that I was going to get killed as the crow, but as the, uh, as the creepy guy, no, I didn't get killed. Did you get the girl? 
No, unfortunately, uh, a guy named Robert Tweedy, who played the good guy, he got the girl. But I got the laughs, which is more important in a movie. But you in, got the, the in the movie, does the creepy guy go? Does the creepy guy get arrested? Not in this one. No, actually, I've never been arrested in a movie that I can recall. I usually, uh, I did kill myself once in a movie called World Without End. I played an alcoholic taxi driver who survives the, the <laughs> nuclear apocalypse, and realizes, well, there are no fares left, so I might as well just go and. Pew, Wow. Wow, okay. So, <laughs> so you played everything under the sun usually? Almost. I, oh, my fav one of my favorite roles was in London Betty. I played uh, a transvestite ex-marine hitman. <laughs> wow. What yeah. was that like? That was a, well, I actually, uh, I had to get a blonde wig, and I got uh, makeup. I borrowed my mother's uh, hoop earrings, and... Uh, I got to where uh, Maggie Champagne was my co-star. She gave me her bra. So in one scene, I'm wearing an orange bra. So it was, uh, and I got to actually fire a uh, gun at a uh, real gun too. They got some cop from Virginia, came up to Connecticut where we shot the film in Plainville. And he showed me how to use the gun with blanks. And I had never used a gun before. And we actually filmed the scene where I was using gun in somebody's home. And quiet on the set action. And I. I pulled out the gun, said my lines, and fired it. You know, those damn, these things are loud. I never truly realized that. You, know, you watch cop shows on TV, you don't think twice about it, but when you're actually holding it, and it's just maybe uh, like two or three feet from your face, and it's just, uh, we had to wait a half hour before everybody's ears uh, stopped ringing before we could do a second take. Wow. I, I mean, I believe it. I mean, so what made you, like, I don't know, get involved with acting to begin with? Like, I got into acting by... Uh, being a good guy, actually, because I was a film critic for the longest time, and I was writing for a site called Film Threat, which is offline now, but will be coming back shortly. And I've helped a lot of aspiring filmmakers get their feet in the door. And uh, they wanted to show their gratitude to me, so when they were making new films, they asked me to come in and do small roles. And I had never acted before, never took an acting class. And they sort of said, hey, wait a minute, you're, you're actually not bad at this. And I realized, oh, I'm not bad. And so I kept getting asked back to do more films and people who make films, because the filmmaking process, for every person on camera, there are about a dozen people behind the camera. Those dozen people were making their own films, and so they contacted me saying, would you like to be in my film? Would you like to be in my film? And so that's how I became an actor. Now, would you say it's a lot of work, or is it really it is hard? A, it's a lot of work. It's hard. You have to know the, uh, the dialogue. You, People think you watch a movie, oh, they're making it up as they go along. No, these films are written out. They're not improvised. So that's a, a little bit of a challenge because it's something I'm not trained in. So when I get a script, I have to just rehearse at home over and over until I get all the dialogue down and then get to the set, get into costume, work with other actors, make sure that there is chemistry there because when there's not chemistry, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge. And uh, to just do it. And you realize, too, that a lot of time and money and energy goes into creating the films and the last thing I want to do is just goof them up. Oh, well, most definitely. I mean, is it hard to, mem to memorize your lines? I was just going to say that. Well, he got there first. Yeah, and, okay. uh, well, actually, you know, it isn't. When, if you just do it over and over, you go line by line. Uh, what I usually do is I get a script and if I have, say, four pages of dialogue, I do maybe my first three lines and I just do it over and over until I'm able to feel comfortable and then go on to the next uh, few lines and then go back to the first and then combine the two and then uh, within some time I'm able to get the, the whole thing down. Are you a method actor or are you, or are you something else? In uh, no, I exactly. wouldn't think of myself as method acting. I don't, I don't uh, invest that much into the uh, performance. I'm able to turn it off when the camera stops running. And I'm not uh, making a nuisance of myself. I, I'm not a big fan of the method uh, performance. So are you more into, like, do you like, prefer to, like, act more in horror films or drama films? Or, like, if you had to choose... Uh, One like, film? Yeah, the, the type of actor you want to be. Like, some people just are yeah. horror film mm -hmm. actors. Some people are drama actors. Like for you, what would you say? I like, you I like to, to do, I've done a do? few dramatic films and I did one film. It was uh, directed by a fellow named E.B. Hughes. Hey, Eric. It was called Pacing the Cage and I had one scene I played a human resources officer interviewing a fellow who was just out of jail and is applying for a job. And it was a straight dramatic part and uh, Eric Hughes' direction was wonderful. When I saw what I did, I was shocked. I was like, I can't believe I, I did this because this is so completely different from my personality. It was a cold, mean-spirited, uh, very petty individual. 
And somehow or other, I got into that character and viewed the character. And I thank the director profusely for giving me the opportunity to explore a character so wildly different from myself. Uh, I've done only a, a handful of dramatic films. I like doing comedies because I enjoy making people laugh. I worked with uh, filmmakers like Michael Leggi and Tom Seymour. Uh, to do uh, comic films and Eric Schrader. I did a film called Burial Boys that was made here in the state a few years ago. It seemed like almost every actor in Connecticut was in it. And I was allowed to improvise in that one. Uh, that was one of the few times that they just said, oh, just this is what you need to do, go out and do it. And it was wonderful because the director had enough faith in me that uh, he would give me uh, his film to just fill it out with words that were coming to, uh, to my mind. They say that's the greatest thing in show business, when a director is able to work with an actor like that, as most directors I, have I, I, I think in any in prof ways. I think in any profession, when you could have the producer, the director, whatever, be able to work side by side and share ideas with the artist or with the, the actor, I think that's very great. Well, that's a be beautiful thing cause a lot, uh, about being in the uh, performing arts and the creative arts, because you do get to collaborate with people in films would be the director, the producer, uh, the editor, the sound person. Am I speaking too loud? Am I whispering too much? And so uh, in publishing as well, such as uh, in uh, with this book, In Search of Lost Films, I have I got to plug it. I mean, if, <laughs> guy's got to make a living. Uh, yeah. My publisher is Bear Manor Media. The um, head of the company was Ben Omar. Uh, I was actually a year late in getting this book to him because there was a lot of research. Mercifully, he was very patient. He realized there was something uh, interesting happening. He said, take your time, get to it, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. A lot of other publishers might have uh, been very, very uh, upset and uh, demanded uh, money back or cancel the project. And when it came time to put together the, uh, the cover art, I had worked with a graphic designer who was hired for the project, and she came up with some ideas, and I said, I like this, but I, can we do this instead, and can we use this color scheme? And she was very open to it, and we went back and forth, and we came up with what we, uh, we have here. So my question is now, and I mean, Freddie, you're going to be more of the guy for this than me. Uh, What's up? How long did it take you to actually finish the book? Finish writing your you know, first ever book? Well, this is not my first book. This is book number seven. Right. He's written seven. I've, I just said that. <laughs> Does he do this all the time? Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, it's we, that it's and the cool. shirt. Yeah. Sure, the purple shirt. I mean, I try to be the Joker, folks. We mentioned about the light you went purple shirt. You went from a bright purple shirt to a darker purple shirt. I, I mean, Mr. J had to make an appearance. Mr. Today. J, what's with the purple in general? Just trying something different. But it's still purple. Yeah, it's we'll still purple. To Thanks, Dad, by the way. Anyway, back if to... You, if you guys want to talk fashion, I can just go down the street. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. No, it's store pick up a couple of... No, no, no. We, we, we want to stay on the air. We don't want to okay. be drunk on the air. Anyway... <laughs> But, you know, how long did it take you to finish your first ever book? Okay, well, you see, I'm coming to this a little differently because I'm a journalist. Okay. A journalist, you have to write a news story, you have to get it done ASAP. So mm -hmm. I tend to be a faster writer than somebody who might be a novelist or a short story writer. So it usually would take me a year to complete a book. This particular book had a lot of research in it, so it took me two years. I was reaching out uh, to a lot of people, including uh, researchers at the Library of Congress, even to the, uh, the National Film Archives in South Africa to get information just to make sure I got everything right into the book. So that's why I took a long, I hoped for the book to be out last year, but uh, it ran over and as I said, uh, Ben Omar at Bear Man Media was very nice about it and said, take your time. He wanted it just right and uh, this is, uh, it came out last month. How is it with public publishing agencies? Because I know they can be a little bit tedious. It depends. If you can get a good relationship going with a publisher, uh, everything would be fine. You have to realize, too, getting the book written is one thing. Getting it out into the uh, mm -hmm. stores, into the open, getting people to read it is another challenge, which is why I'm doing this show, uh, to help promote it, and I'm grateful for you guys having me. Were you ever nervous writing that? Or writing any of your books in general? I'm nervous to a certain extent because um, I have an idea what the book should be like. Will I be able to get it finished? Uh, will I get it finished in time? Will people like it? Will I get my facts correct? Th there's a lot of uh, concern that goes into a book. But once it's all wrapped up and delivered, uh, you just have to have faith in the book. You could, uh, otherwise, you're just going to be uh, nervous endlessly and nothing's going to be accomplished. I mean, that's very true. I always say, you know, you got to believe in your work. If you don't like your work, then nobody else will. It's the same like thing like work. if you don't like your cook and nobody else is going to like it. So if you don't try your own food that you cook, <laughs> yeah. don't expect anybody else to try it. 
Uh, we also want to remind everybody that this is a live call-in show, and you can you can call, call at the number below at the end at the bottom of your screen. That's yep, right, right there, and uh, you can ask me questions. You can ask our guest Phil here questions. You can ask Fred questions, and of course, about the you could ask me about the shirt. Yeah, uh, about that. Um, back to that. <laughs> back um, to, fact number two. Fact number two. How long did it take you to realize that every week you've been wearing a purple shirt? Couple weeks. Couple weeks. <laughs> you keep talking. It's okay. I'm just promoting the book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next week, uh, another purple shirt. Purple with stripes. No, it'll probably be stripes. Colorado Rockies. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I oh, hold up. How are you a Yankee fan? You wear more purple than blue. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, back to Phil. Oh, hold um, on. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. You know, so, Phil, as a kid, who was your, I don't know, you, you do a bunch of different things. So, who was your inspiration, like, of, you know, actors or writers in that time for you? Well, I, d I never intended to be an actor, so there was no actor that inspired me. I wanted to be a writer ever since I was young. I... Mm -hmm. Wanted to be a writer primarily because of the old Twilight Zone show, Rod Serling's show, because those shows were so brilliantly written, and they were just so very, very different. It's like, wow. And I, I would watch this stuff. It's like, this is incredible. Can I come up with something like that? And what did you think of War of the Worlds when it first came out? Which uh, which film was that? The the, 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 the 1953 yeah. version. Well, I saw it on television, but uh, it was uh, I like that. Did you ever read the H.G. Wells book that it was based on? No, but I've heard he's classic. It so is classic. It's uh, you can get it online for free, or you can go over to Barnes and Noble. They have it in the classic section. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, Fred, you're you're a big fan of Shakespeare, really? <laughs> Shakespeare, yeah, yeah. Shakespeare, Poe. What Shakespeare uh, do you like? Romeo and Juliet. Really? Yeah. Well, that's nice. <laughs> he also lo he loves Edgar Allan Poe. But, but I also like King. Uh, no, it's not King. King it's, Lear? Uh, Hamlet. Oh, Hamlet, yes. I haven't read the whole thing, but I read bits and pieces. It's like, wow. Mm, you, should, you should read the whole thing. You should see the f a lot of film versions, too. Now, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, the, Phil, me and Freddie, we, we talk about this a lot off the air. Do you think, and Freddie, you're, you're going to love this. Do you think the, when it comes to books, it's a kind of a dying breed? Like a yeah. dying industry? I mean, the, the, uh, the, whole the book reading? industry? Yeah, like the whole reading thing? No, it isn't. Um, because there will always be people reading books, whether it's going to be for school, whether it's going to be for just sitting on the beach, whether it's going to be in paper like I have, or it's going to be on, uh, on Kindle or Nook or any of the... the re it's not going away. Uh, it may not be encouraged the way it had been in the past, and we may not have the selection of uh, provocative books out that uh, they had years ago, but there's still a lot of uh, great books that are being written and being published, and uh, as far as I know, the, the publishing industry hasn't uh, collapsed and gone away yet. So well, you don't think because it's all gone online? No, in fact, out? in any way, I think going online may have even expanded it more. More people are reading. Problem though is quality control, because a lot of people are self-publishing, yeah. and do-it-yourself is not the same thing as do-it-correctly. So True. True. Uh, in that sense, you don't have editors uh, looking over work and making sure that you're uh, on target and focused with what you're doing. But there are still a lot of people uh, who are wonderful writers in all different aspects of uh, publishing, whether it's entertainment, politics, sports, business, who are doing it themselves. And uh, they've gotten larger audiences than the, uh, the newspapers or magazines that preceded them. So do you think it's better to do it yourself? It depends on the personality. Uh, it's a lot of work. And being a writer, I, I can't be flippant about it. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of focus. Uh, I would look rather stupid if I were to put a book together that's full of mistakes, uh, typographical errors, uh, poor research. You have to make sure it's 100% before you uh, go out. The way you're doing a movie, too, you wouldn't go to the Cineplex and see uh, Mark Wahlberg or, or De Niro flubbing their lines or, or giggling when they're, sure, they're sure. doing their they're dialogue. Right. It has to be a hundred, or you wouldn't see the special effects. You see the string holding up the, uh, the rocket ship. Yeah, right. No, that's, uh, that's not how it's done. It, it takes a lot of work, a lot of focus. And if you don't have the discipline to do it, you're not going to succeed. It's one thing to have talent, but you have to have discipline. Without that, you're just shot. That's, I, I, I that's do true. believe that. That's true. So, I mean, like, you do books and you do acting. 
What, what do you, is there anything else you, you would like to do next? Well, I'm doing broadcasting. I'm doing okay. uh, the new, uh, the podcast. It's not new, it's a reboot. It's the online movie show. And I get to interview people who make films, uh, people who write about films, because everybody likes to talk about movies. And so I'm just taking what is a, a regular pleasure and uh, adding that to my career. So, I mean, now we have podcasts, we, you know, I don't, I don't know, for me, it's like, Everything's on the internet now, you yeah. know. So it's like is podcast like the new internet radio. Podcast or? is basically the new radio. It is a new radio to a right. certain extent. Uh, I mean, there are people who still listen to satellite radio, Howard Stern, and that, and that bunch. And there are also people who would tune into some people, maybe older folks like me, would tune into the radio when they're driving in the car or having breakfast. Sure. It hasn't gone away completely. It's not what it used to be. I was visiting my mother the past week, and she put on Rush Limbaugh's show. It's on an AM station here in Connecticut. And whatever you think of him, hey, he's he's still on the air, and he's been doing this for decades, and uh, he still has an audience, and and. That's AM radio. You know, I always say, even when I'm doing this show, when I'm doing music, if, you know, you do it for the audience that you do grab. You know, me and Freddie, you know, we do this show to inspire the disability community, but uh, also, if, if it touches people that are non-disabled, great. You know, but more importantly, we enjoy doing what we do. We enjoy mm -hmm. uh, bringing this to you guys, and more Each importantly, and every week. without you guys, we couldn't do it. So no, we and, I, and I enjoy watching the show, too. I'm not part of the disabled community, but I enjoy it as a talk show. I enjoy the guests you've had. You had uh, I called in a couple of weeks ago when Kevin Dolan was here. Yep. And, uh, shout out to Kevin. Shout out, definitely. Great guy. And this is uh, a lot of fun to watch. And you're thinking, oh, well, this, this isn't ABC or CNN or Fox or whatnot. But this is, this is wonderful. I, I actually find myself watching this show instead of watching what's on uh, regular television. Well, thank you. We, we really do appreciate it. Well, we appreciate it. it. It's our so, pleasure to have you on the show. Exactly. So what do, what do you think of Freddie's shirt? What do I think? Well, it's, uh, it needs to be ironed. I mean, that's uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit of rumpled little bit. over here but, yeah. uh, and over on the sleeves. But uh, purple, uh, purple compliments you. I think this is quite nice, actually. <laughs> it's a good yeah. color. And, uh, hey, Fred. What's up? Since you let me sleep, you know, at the top of our show here, um, about the background. What about the background? You got the memo wrong. Wrong country. <laughs> no offense. I mean, Phil wanted the background. I wanted the background, definitely. I grew up uh, in a section of New York City that had a large Japanese population. When I was in second okay, grade, so I learned to, uh, so what happened to the rising sun? Hey, hey, well, back with, the, no, 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 go back to the rising sun. Come on, you can do better. That's it. So what, uh, since you guys did all that, is there uh, anybody order takeout while we were at it? No. I mean, we did, but we ate it all. And you didn't leave me none? Well, I let you go. I got you an egg roll at the house. Why is it at the house? Not <laughs> anyway, like I said before, guys, this is a live call-in show. <laughs> you can call at the bottom of your the screen, screen. Yeah. and you can ask Freddie, why is my egg roll here? Or you can ask Phil, why didn't you tell Freddie to leave my egg roll? You know, I, I didn't know this, this came with dinner. I mean, I was... I uh, didn't know this came with I, dinner. I, I didn't realize it was going to be fed. I didn't know dinner yeah. either because yeah. somebody didn't... You know what? I should walk out of here. Well, you gotta, you know, you gotta <laughs> walk out of here. You need to roll out of here, don't you? We'll have to work on that one. Yeah. Uh, we got a phone here. Why don't you call for uh, delivery? Is there a Chinese place around here you could? Uh, There's Panda right down the street. Yeah, all right. You got the number? No. no. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's also one thing too. Doing live television. Be prepared. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Be prepared to have hot sauce and wonton soup next time. Hot sauce and wonton soup. Remember that, folks? He said that live on TV. Yes, I did. Hot sauce and wonton soup. You can call in and talk about the wonton soup and the hot sauce if you want. Anyway, Freddie, you want to also remind folks that you can watch this episode and other episodes on our YouTube channel with Keeping It Real with David King. Yep. We also have a Facebook page called Keeping It Real TV, a Twitter page called 13, 13 Keeping It Real, Real with the at sign in front of it, mm -hmm. a Snapchat, Hashtag. which is... KIR up close and an Instagram with keeping it real up close. You can follow us all on those mentioned below. Yep. And you can give us your opinions, what you want to see on the show, what you don't want to see on the show, what you want to see more of or less of. Be sure to comment on the videos on YouTube. Did you just really do the, the thumbs up thing? It's a good idea. You don't want people doing thumbs down on YouTube. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you got the whole like our page. Yeah, but Definitely. you got the whole Tony the Tiger thing going on. Great. No, you had the outfit a couple months ago. 
Look, this ain't about me and my tiger outfit. This is about you and the great thumbs up. Did Tony the Tiger do the thumbs up or was he more like the okay? I, for, I forgot. I or he had the fist. It's like, yeah, it's great. I, I don't know. Yeah. They don't change the commercials. Like I, don't know. It's, I don't know. It's been ages since I've seen Tony. Is he still on TV? I haven't even seen him either. Have you seen Tony? No, I haven't seen Tony the Tiger. No. That's no. sad. <laughs> yeah, you know, the funny thing is, it's a little off top, but... Oh, it's a lot off topic. I didn't come here to talk about Tony the Tiger. Me neither. Sorry. I'm sorry about that's that. That's okay. You should have book on the cornflakes. They're still around. <laughs> but anyway, so what is your next book going to be about? I have absolutely no idea. I mean, it took me two years to write this book. This is, I've written seven books in 12 years, so I'm exhausted. I mean, I'm going to go back to your place and just fall asleep, too, because mm -hmm. I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm bushed from this, and I've been doing a lot of promotion for this, but I don't know uh, what's going to be happening next. I mean, what is your future plans with everything you're doing? I'm just doing what I'm doing. I've, I've learned uh, at this point in my life that if you try to choreograph your life and say, I'm going to achieve this by this date and this by this date, uh, it's not going to happen. It's, it's just going to be uh, complete chaos. The most wonderful things have happened in my life when I least expected it, where and when, uh, I, I never imagined it to happen. I started writing books uh, totally by accident because uh, my publisher at Film Threat, uh, Chris Gore, back in 2004 was contracted to, uh, to do a book and he wasn't able to do it. So he called me and said, hey, would you like to uh, take over this project for me? And that's how I started writing books. So I wasn't even planning to do that. And the same thing with acting. I never intended to be in films until somebody said, would you like to have a small role in my movie? And uh, that was the start of uh, 20 plus films. Wow. But well, looks like you're a very, <coughs> you're a very, really busy man. And uh, well, I, I mean, I hope you continue doing it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have to go out and give me a copy of this book as well. And Freddie, I'm I... am going to have to get two copies. You don't have a copy already? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, we're but you can get it on Amazon or through Bear Manor Media or any of the online sites, uh, barnesandnoble.com, oldies.com. I think even walmart.com has this too. It's on eBay as well for can some you get reason. It in, now, can you get it in the store? Yes. It's possible. You'd have to ask at the store. They may have to order it. But it's, uh, it's out there. Nice. So, you know... We got a couple of minutes left on the show. Anybody want to say anything before? Want to call know? in? No callers tonight. No, no callers. Call Everybody must be asleep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much Chinese food. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, but you know, I think it's very good that one, you're doing something very positive, and it gives a lot of young uh, viewers a way to see that you can do something positive with your life. You can. You ha you. As I said, you have to be disciplined in what you're doing. Right. Be serious about it. Be focused. Have fun doing it. Don't don't. When it's not fun anymore, then you should really consider doing something else. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. And that's the other thing. You enjoy what you do. Uh, just like you know, we here tonight. We enjoy what we do. We have a good yeah. time. And you know, that's the whole thing. When you grow up in life, you want to do something that you enjoy doing. You don't want to be stuck at Burger King. Not that there's anything wrong with Burger King, but you know, be like, oh, I gotta work here. I ain't gonna work there. You know, you want to enjoy yourself. You know, I, I love what I do. I love being in front of you guys. I love being part of this disability community. Yeah. And I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. Nope. You know, I, I love all my friends, family, and I couldn't complain. But we've got like a minute left in the show. Any last words, Fred? Well, just go out and do what you want. Do, be, do, do what you want. Be passionate about what you do and enjoy what you do. Phil? What he said. I, I, I said like this. At the end of the day, no matter what you do, no matter, you know, your work, no matter where you work, enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy the people you with. You know, because life is short. Oh, yeah. There you know, is. Life is very short. And instead of going to jail or getting into some other stuff, like you, you can write a book. Yeah, well, I haven't gone to jail yet, so. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, and we live in a day and age where crime is like number one and mm -hmm. people need ways to channel their anger and stuff like that and writing channel books. your energy into doing what you enjoy right. doing Turn, uh, what could and, be and don't think whatever body. you're doing is, is trivial or wouldn't be appreciated if you have pride in your work and you think you're doing something special you are doing something special and let others follow and appreciate what you're doing and soon enough you'll start to build an audience exactly so with that said i'm david king i'm fred Silbert, and i'm phil hall thank you for watching and have a good night we are good.